Amidst the tremendous uncertainty of our lives, we need to find a way to meet difficulties, crises, problems and troubles. We need to find a way to understand, transform and overcome these difficulties with the deeper acceptance, insight and compassion. I think he's always did that wonderfully this afternoon. I think he gave some very, very insightful way to deal with the problem that we are facing. But I, so therefore, I won't repeat what his illness already spoke about, but I will cover other areas. So by doing so, we can discover the peace of mind, stability, and the fulfillment we need so much to face the challenges of the world today. Now, regardless of who we are, the main purpose of our life, you could call it the heart of being human, is to be happy. All of us share the same wish, the same right to seek happiness and to avoid suffering. But if you look closely, we can see there are two kinds of happiness. One is based on more physical comfort. We can call it the happiness of the senses or the happiness of the pleasure. But the other is founded on a deeper mental contentment. In Tibetan we call it choshe. One, the first one can be very expensive and often not satisfying. But the other one, as usual, often says, you see, we don't have to buy mind. You know, we all have the mind. So therefore, if we have that, it can be absolutely satisfying. Now, the ancient Greek philosopher Socrates said, contentment is the natural wealth. Luxury is artificial poverty. As in also in the Bible, I have learned in whatever state I am therein to be content. The prophet Muhammad said, riches come not from the abundance of worldly goods, but from the contented mind. And also, as Buddha said in the Dhammapada, which is one of the most important scriptures in the Buddhist tradition, he says that contentment is the most excellent wealth. And as the great Indian master Nagarjuna, who is known as quoted many times, is only considered to be the second to Buddha, in his letter to a friend, he said, there is no treasure like contentment. Now, Many people spend all their time and energy trying to accumulate and maintain material or outer wealth. But this leaves them very little opportunity to cultivate the inner wealth, the qualities such as compassion, patience, as His Holiness have been speaking about it. And this imbalance makes them particularly vulnerable and unable to cope with many of the challenges of life. But if we have this deeper inner peace and contentment, this inner wealth, then even when we go through suffering, our mind can still be happy. This explains how there are some people who can have every material advantage yet remain unsatisfied and discontent, while there are others who are always satisfied and content, even amidst the most difficult circumstances. As this great saints of the past used to say, it is the foolish that go looking for happiness outside of themselves. Whereas the wise and learned know all the happiness and the causes of happiness lie in our mind and heart, present within ourselves. So in fact, you could say, His Holy Dalai Lama says, the principal characteristic of genuine happiness is inner peace and contentment. If we have contentment, this is essence of his own uh, philosophy or teaching. If we have contentment, inner peace as your basis, as your ground, then your mind will be relaxed and at ease. And if the mind is relaxed and at ease, then no matter what difficulties or crisis you encounter, you will not be disturbed. Your basic sense of well-being will not be undermined either. As a result, you'll be able to carry on your everyday life, your work, your responsibilities more efficiently. 
and your mind will have the wisdom to discern what to do and what not to do. In turn, your life will become happier, and even when difficulties arise, you'll be able to turn them to your advantage. So, for your own inner peace and stability, taking care of your mind and heart is crucial. Once your own mind is more at peace, then both inner and outer harmony will automatically follow. That's the end of the talk. <laughs> That's the end of the first part. Now, uh, I would like to give a little bit of essence of the teaching of Buddha. Because you see, actually the teaching of Buddha is extraordinarily vast. What Buddha taught alone, volume over 100. Not to talk about the work of the great Indian masters, but volume over 200. But what's wonderful is that even though the teaching of the Buddha is vast, very vast, but it can be essentialized. In fact, when Buddha was asked, what is the essence of teaching? In Tibetan, it sounds like this. Which when you translate into English roughly, he says, commit not a single unwholesome action. That's the first thing. Second, cultivate a wealth of virtue. Third, to tame this mind of ours. This is the teaching of the Buddhas. First of all, commit not a single unwholesome action. What does that mean? What it means is that, you, see, you might say, but how can I possibly not commit a single unwholesome action? What it really means, when the masters explained it, that as much as possible, abandon all the unwholesome, negative and harmful actions, which are the cause of suffering for yourself and others. That is to say, if you do not want suffering, then you must abandon the cause of suffering, which is ignorance, negative emotion, negative actions. On the other hand, if you want happiness, then cultivate the wealth of virtue, the second line of teaching of Buddha, which means as much as possible, adopt all the positive, wholesome, and beneficial actions of the body, speech, mind, which are the cause of happiness for yourself and others. So therefore, if you do not want suffering, then you must remove the cause of suffering, which is ignorance, negative emotion, negative action. Is it clear? To put it very simply, and if you want to have happiness, the cause of happiness is wisdom, positive emotions such as love and compassion, and positive actions. In fact, many great Tibetan masters always say, if you cannot help, at least don't harm. Most important of all, don't keep malice, hatred in your heart. Don't keep a black heart. Most important is keep your mind and heart pure. In fact, the great master, Atisha, great Kadamba master, he often, whenever he meets people, he would always ask them, instead of asking them, he normally would say, how are you, how is your family? You know, instead of asking that, he would say, how is your good heart today? The most important is the good heart. That's why when he's holiness, I had the great good fortune to actually uh, arrange and also be part of his holiness' first visit to the West in 1973. On those occasions, he always used to teach on good heart. And he always used to say, my religion is very simple. My religion is kind. Is that clear? Now, You see, because if you look really deeply, I think he's done it this, this afternoon spoke about not being foolishly selfish, but wisely so. Remember? Yeah. So therefore, if you really want to look out, see, you see, of course, taking care of yourself is important, you know. But in so doing, you have to do it what really good for your long-term interest. And what is interesting is when you look in that way, you realize that actually harming others harms you, helping others helps you. 
clear. When you realize that, then suddenly you realize, ah, my happiness and my suffering is connected with happiness, suffering of others. So that we are all interconnected. And realize the interdependence. And through this interconnectedness, then it inspires altruism. Initially, you may be thinking of yourself only, your innate self-interest, but when you realize deeply that your happiness is connected with happiness of others, your suffering is connected with suffering of others, then you see, you realize this inspires altruism. As the great uh, Bodhisattva Shantideva, he said, all the happiness there is in this world comes from thinking of others. All the suffering there is in this world comes from thinking of yourself only. Is that clear? And then also, I think he's only spoke a little bit, you see, when you speak about what is the basic Buddhist philosophy, I mean, which is common to all schools, you know, I, I want to say one thing very briefly before we go further, is that actually these three lines, commit not a single unwholesome action, cultivate the wealth of virtue, and to tame this mind of ours, is actually related to the three yanas, or the three vehicles of the teaching of Buddha. The first time, commit not a single, I know there are many Buddhist practitioners, here, so therefore you're not so unfamiliar, so I'll share this with you. Commit not a single unwholesome action is connect with the basic vehicle. Because in the basic vehicle, the one of the most, I'd say basic vehicle rather than the word Hinayana, that's not so appropriate, the root yana or the fundamental vayana. And in that you see the, one of the most important things, the practice of refuge. In the refuge, the precept, the most important precept is the precept of Dharma which is non-harming. So therefore, the first line, commit not a single unwholesome action, is related to non-harming, which is related to the basic vehicle of the teaching of Buddha. And also, therefore, is peace. Second line, cultivate the wealth of virtue, is compassion, related to the mind. Third, taming the mind, is Vajrayana. Even though, of course, taming the mind is the basis of all Buddhist teachings. Because as the Dharma often says, that Buddhism is about transforming them. Now, when we speak about the basic view or, or the basic philosophy, philosophy is when you don't practice, you call it philosophy. When you practice it, you call it the view. What is the basic Buddhist philosophy is that everything is interdependent. Everything is interdependent. Just as we realize that. When we harm others, it harms you. When you help others, it helps you. Is that clear? So that... His own Dalai Lama says that that philosophy, that Buddhist view, is not just a Buddhist philosophy, but it's very practical, as he spoke a little bit this morning also. Like, for example, when we get angry, someone really pisses you off completely, makes you really angry, and that person becomes your target, you know, anger grows and strengthens. This is when we don't examine, when we think that person exists independently. But when you look, really take a step back and really examine, as His Holiness encouraged us, very much teaching Buddha, Buddha encouraged us to examine, to analyze. When you do that, you realize that there are many cause and conditions. It's not so simple. You yourself may be also implicated in that aspect. So when that happens, the intensity of your anger or the target of blame begins to slowly diminish. Is that clear? When that happens, then it, it really helps you to remove the violence in you. So it leads to the fundamental Buddhist action of conduct is non-violence, non-harm. Is that clear? View of interdependence inspires non-harm. Is that clear? That when you develop, of course, the view of interdependence more on a deeper level, it leads to shunyata, the view of the great emptiness in the Maya and the teachings. As well as when you develop the non-harming more deeper way, it leads to also altruism and compassion. So basically, that these three lines embody the essence of the three vehicles of teaching Buddha. I remember one of my masters, Tingu Kensram Jews, used to say, a great learned master from these three lines will enumerate volumes. 
But the most important of all, you see, is to tame this mind of ours. That's the key thing. I'm going to focus on that. But the entire teaching of Buddha can be summed up into one single line to tame this mind of ours. In Tibetan, you say, rang is sem. Rang means oneself, sem means mind, ndul is to subjugate, to tame, or transform, or conquer. It doesn't say conquer somebody else's mind, your mind. See, that thing locally, act globally. Very much. Is that clear? Very much to tame. You see, really, is the main thing is to tame, to transform, and conquer the mind of ours. Because you see, mind is the root of everything. Is the creator of happiness and the creator of suffering. It's sometimes in the teachings, Tibetan teachings are called the universal ordering principle. Mind is the universal ordering principle. Tibetan kunye gyalpo, universal ordering principle. Creator of happiness, creator of suffering, and creator of what we call samsara, and creator of what we call nirvana is the mind. In fact, I know some of you know what samsara is, but it is a very a good, simple definition for those who do not know. Is that the samsara is a cycle of existence of birth and death, characterized by suffering and determined by harmful emotions and our actions to come. Basically, because of ignorance, negative emotions, negative actions result in suffering, is what samsara is. As Shantideva so wonderfully put it, he said, though longing to be happy, in their ignorance they destroy their own happiness as if it was the worst enemy. Though they wish to get rid of suffering, yet they run head along towards suffering. Poor babies. Our aim and our action go on contrary. We want happiness, but we do everything that brings about suffering. That's something. Whereas nirvana is literally the state of beyond suffering and sorrow. It can't be said to be the state of Buddhahood. As the poet John Milton said in Paradise Lost, he said, the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell and hell of heaven. So first of all, you know, you see, happiness does not exist objectively, we know that. Otherwise, we, most of us have bought it already. It is subject to one's experience. So the most important thing is really, we need to conquer, to put it very simply, if we tame, or these are all different ways of saying it, tame, transform, conquer, same. If you tame, transform, and conquer your mind, then what happens is this, then your own experience and your perception will be also transformed. Thereby, even the appearance and circumstances will appear differently. Is that clear? That's the key point. In fact, in Tibetan Buddhism, there are four major lineages. One of them is the lineage of the Mahamudra, the Kagyu lineage. They're the first human master. He's called Telopa. And his disciple was the great Pandit Naropa. And his disciple was the great Tibetan translator, the Marpa. And his disciple, Marpa disciple, was the great Tibetan yogi saint, Milarepa, who inspired millions of practitioners. He's very much, he's only Dalama's hero. Now when Telopa, in his heart advice, he said to Naropa, he said, who now I am much in Zimbabwe, son, it's not the appearances that bind us, that imprison us. It's a grasping. So a ban grasping on Naropa. Did you get that? I will probably repeat again later. Because sometimes important things need to be repeated again and again because we forget again and again. 
as also the great Zen master Suzuki Roshi used to say, the wisdom of repetition. Anyway, so very much now we're talking about the mind is both the creator of samsara and nirvana. Since mind is the creator of both samsara and nirvana, so what is the position of mind that creates samsara? What is the state of mind that brings about nirvana? As the great masters, you see, in the kind of both dukshan, which is the teaching of great perfection, and the Muhammad, the great masters. Some of my masters, they would say, it's very, it's wonderful. Sometimes when I first heard this, it really brought me uh, goose pimples, you know? <laughs> you know goose pimples, you feel really so inspired. They would say, samsara is mind turned outwardly lost in its projection. Whereas nirvana is mind turned inwardly recognizing his nature. Did you hear that? Because to give you a little bit of background, you see, when we talk about mind, normally you see in the modern world, we think of mind as just merely the thoughts and emotions. But actually that is not the mind itself. The thoughts and emotions are just merely the appearance of the mind, like the sun's rays, but not the sun itself. So there's the appearance of mind, there's the essence and nature of mind. But most of us, our mind is turned outwardly lost in thoughts and emotions and the projection. A lot of time, very much projection, a lot of projection. In fact, in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, or the whole cycle of teaching on life and death called the Pardo teachings, uh, which I try to uh, communicate in the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. In that, the great master Padmasambhava, who brought the teaching of Buddha to Tibet, and often consider him as the, as the second Buddha, he said that the main task we have in this life, in the part of this life, is to work with our mind and its projections. Purify our perception. Purify our perception. I think his donors spoke this morning about, remember, they got into cognitive therapy, that you see our perception is 90% stained by our projection. Like for example, you're angry. That it, you see 90% anger, only 10% reality. So you see, that's the projection, that we need the projection. I mean, you know, there's so much projection, so much story here, completely useless. Stories, 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 which can make us go crazy. And mind is incredible, is mind, if you really know how to use your mind, it's the, the most wonderful thing, but if you do not know how to use it, it's a nightmare. So you see, whole thing about teaching Buddha is how to work with the mind, transform the mind. In that samsara is mind turned outwardly, loss in projection. Nirvana is mind turned inwardly, recognizing its true nature. As the great master used to say, it is not outwardly looking, but inwardly seeing. Not outwardly looking, but inwardly seeing. In fact, remember when I talk about the two aspects of mind, the appearance aspect of mind, and the essence and nature of mind, he's always, always talked about as appearance and reality. Reality is connected with the nature of mind. And then the more the appearances, the ones are the thoughts, emotions, and projections. You understand? So that is what we need to purify. Samsara is mind turned outwardly, loss in projection. Nirvana is mind turned inwardly, recognizing in nature. There's a wonderful saying by also the great master Padmasambhava. He said, don't seek to investigate the root of phenomena, but investigate the root of mind. Once the root of mind has been found, you will know one thing, yet all is thereby freed or dissolved. But if the root of mind you fail to find, 
you will know everything but nothing understand. So the crucial point is what direction our mind is turned, where there's outwardly looking, loss in thoughts and emotions, or inwardly seeing, recognizing its true nature. That's really the key. As I said earlier, if you tame, transform, conquer your mind, then you will transform your own perception, your own experience, thereby even the circumstances and the outer appearances will change and appear differently. Because mind in its true nature, the, the essence of mind is pure, like a crystal, like a mirror. Whatever you place, if you put, if you put green cloth under the crystal, it becomes green, yellow cloth, yellow, red cloth, red. But crystal itself is neither green nor yellow or this. Like a mirror will reflect all kinds of things. But the reflections never, ever actually dirty the mirror. In fact, our really true nature mind is always pure. Never stained by any impurity. That's the principle of the Buddha nature, which according to the Buddhist teaching, so is that exists in all of us as a fundamental nature, as fundamental goodness. So, on the deeper level, our mind is always pure and pristine, like the crystal. But on the relative level, as Buddha said, we are what we think. All that we are rise with the thoughts. With the thoughts, we make the world. Speak or act with impure mind, and trouble will follow you as the wheel follows the ox that draws the car. We are what we think. All that we are rises with our thoughts. With our thoughts, we make the world. Speak or act with a pure mind, and happiness will follow you as your shadow unshakable. Even Shakespeare says in Hamlet, there's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. But the problem is with us, that we are everywhere, we are scattered everywhere, and nobody is at home. So, in many ways, we miss ourselves. In fact, we've lost the sense of being. We always turn outwardly, lost in thoughts and emotions. We are always doing things. We are always speaking. We are always thinking or stinking. But we do not know who the doer is, or speaker, or not mindful aware of the thinker. So, so the fundamentally, what we need to do is to bring the mind home. Bring the mind home. As the French philosopher Pascal once said, all of men's difficulties are caused by his inability to sit quietly in a room by himself. As we said earlier, our minds are turned out to be lost in thoughts and emotions, so much so that we have lost the sense of a real or a true being or who we really are, which would almost say we are homesick for our true nature. So meditation then, on the more deeper level, is really bringing the mind home in the deepest possible sense. 